Hello and welcome to this Family Does Everything. My name is Alexandria and this is one of the videos. I actually said I was going to do one on all his filings. So here are a few of them. So let's sit back, watch, and analyze the Daryl Brooks trial. All right, good morning, everyone. The court will call State of Wisconsin versus Darrell Brooks, case number 21, CF 1848. Uh, record should reflect that the state appears this morning uh, by District Attorney Sue Upper, Deputy District Attorney Leslie Basie, Assistant District Attorney Zach Wichow, uh, and the defendant, Darrell Brooks, appears in person in custody. I'd also like the record to reflect that he is appearing in jail attire today. He's also wearing a mask. Uh, my name is Daryl Brooks Jr. I would like the opportunity to state that I'm here concerning this matter as third party intervener in this matter, appearing as authorized representative for my client. I accept for value and return for value all the charging instruments in this matter and make my exemption available for discharge of all obligations and charges connected with this case. I do not dispute any of the facts in the charging instruments and would like to now uh, reserve my rights if I may. Um, Mr. Brooks, you just interrupted me within a minute of us starting this case here today. Respectfully, I'm asking you to respectfully not interrupt me. That's the second time. So I can go through the list of things that I need to get through this morning. I just wanted it stated for the record. That Mr. Brooks, it wasn't the proper time to do that. That's now the third interruption. So. With all due respect, Your Honor, every Mr. time Brooks, we. Every by time saying we've... all due respect doesn't change the fact that you're interrupting me. Your objection is noted, all right? But you need to stop interrupting me um, so I can get through what needs to be done. But it is my I have right a number to, of documents that I need right to discuss to, this morning. Right to, Mr. Brooks, you do not have a right to interrupt the court. No, um, was, I will remind you once again of the uh, Supreme Court rule. It's on a yellow laminated, uh, double-sided, uh, piece of paper that is before you. Um, I, I checked, I verified, that, uh, it is. I accept it in return. Mr. Value, Brooks, that's right? yet another interruption. Let me get through this, please. I just want for the you record. You will have an opportunity when I'll, I give you an I'll opportunity. No one else is speaking at the moment but me. You need to stop interrupting. I don't identify by that name. Mr. Brooks, I am going to keep going. You are warned. You need to follow the standards of courtesy and decorum for the courts of Wisconsin. I Chapter 62, to, that's to, another Honor, interruption. I intend to follow decorum. This court comes with a history of Mr. Brooks interrupting now. This is day four, and every day Mr. Brooks has interrupted. It has resulted in Mr. Brooks being uh, placed in a uh, neighboring courtroom so that this court can efficiently, effectively, and with dignity uh, preside over this case here today. I, I am object, well aware I that's another interruption. Honor. I'm well I, I aware. Stop talking. Which I have the right to do. I'm well and aware, Mr. Brooks, that you object to the name to that any, uh, has identified on the information and all documents in this case. Your objection is noted. It does not need name. to be repeated. <laughs> what is your name? I will make a record right now. Uh, the court notes a, con a continuing objection by Mr. Brooks of uh, his name uh, and uh, that he objects to being here. Uh, I know he's filed a number of documents previously related to, to that. Those here. documents are I'll of record. There's another document that's trying. filed. At least two more interruptions just now. I believe I'm up to eight. Mr. Brooks, you're advised that continued interruptions will result in you forfeiting your right to be present in this courtroom where you'll be taken to the courtroom next door to appear by video and audio I don't means to participate to from the courtroom. In, that's another interruption. And you haven't shown me any lawful uh, case law that I can be removed from the court Mr. Brooks, proceedings in a trial and forced under coercion and, and, and duress 
to appear in the trial that I am needed, that I've tried to express that I have the Mr. right Mr. Brooks, there's a for. proper manner in which you raise objections. You have not followed that proper procedure. You are unable or unwilling to abide by simple rules of civility. You, you interrupt, you don't wait for anyone to finish, um, and it will result with you being removed from the courtroom. Um, so you are once that, again uh, reminded of that. I'm going to give a little slack at the moment only because we are not in the presence of the jury. I'd like to uh, go through a couple of things, the first of which is the jail attire. Mr. Brooks, we, meaning myself and the jail, have made arrangements by allowing folks to bring in uh, street clothing for you. You've appeared previously um, in a suit and tie, uh, very appropriate for a trial. If you no longer have those clothes available, the jail has a supply of clothes that they can also lend to an inmate. The reason we um, make those arrangements during trial, sir, is because this court has taken a number of steps to shield from this jury that you are in custody. Your hands are not shackled, okay? There are skirts My around are each shackled. one of the tables. I'm aware of the feet shackles. That's yet another interruption. I'm aware of the shackles on your uh, feet, and that's why the skirts are on your table and frankly, all of the tables, right? So that it appears to be the same for anyone coming in and viewing. Um, again, their arrangements have been made for you to appear in street clothes or civilian clothes. Um, I would like you to appear in street clothes. And the reason why, sir, is to reduce or even eliminate even the appearance that you are in custody. And it is your choice, though. Are you willing to go back to your cell and put on your suit? Um, it is my right to do so or to not do so. And at this point, Your Honor, who doesn't know that I'm in custody? Mr. Brooks, I've had many trials with individuals who were in custody, and when I've talked to the jurors after the conclusion of the case, they had no idea. The whole point of allowing for street clothing is not only to shield jurors from the fact that you are in custody, but also uh, you being in a suit and a tie or other street clothing I think also lends to the dignity of the proceedings. This is a trial. Um, again, it is your choice. Are you willing to go back to your cell and be dressed in the street clothes that you previously appeared in? With all due respect, I do not agree with that assessment whatsoever. There's no possible way that anybody will not know that I am in custody. I think that's a well-known fact because it's reported on every day in the media. It's shown every day on the news where I am, what jail I'm housed in, and that I'm in custody. It's virtually impossible for anybody to not know that I'm in custody. Mr. Brooks, did you hear the question that I asked you? And I respectfully keep the position that I just put on the record. Mr. Brooks, I will ask you again. Are you willing to go back to your cell or into the jail and put on street clothes? I do not consent or agree to anything that you just stated, Your Honor. All right, he did not provide an answer to a very direct question. Uh, let the record be very clear that Mr. Brooks was given multiple opportunities to answer that question. Um, and I and go you. back, Mr. Brooks, that's yet another interruption. Um, I will advise you, sir, that at any point in time, if you wish to put street clothes on, um, I would give you that opportunity to do so. You've already heard it is my preference. Um, you've already heard me advise you regarding uh, the steps that have been taken to shield the fact that you are in custody from the jurors. Um, you refuse to answer my question about I mean, whether refuse. you would uh, go back to like the jail. That's another interruption. 
Um, so based on his refusal and his choice to come, that's another interruption. To say, to say based upon his uh, failure to answer my question directly, I will take I that as refused. a non-response, but he came to court that here today. That's another interruption. Um, I will take that uh, because he's come to court here today in his jail attire, that that is a, a choice that he has made freely. Uh, voluntarily and intelligently. No one has forced him to come I to jail to in those clothes. This court is encouraging him not to. He's appeared previously in his uh, street clothes in what I would describe as a very nice suit and tie, um, but it is his choice to not do that and we will proceed accordingly. So while we're on the record, may I challenge the subject matter jury? No, you may not, way. sir. You need to file a motion in order to do that. Um, um, so, Mr. Brooks, I filed haven't even been uh, responded to. I gave uh, Mr. Brooks, you're interrupting me no, yet you, again. You just weren't speaking, All right, so I, I Mr. Interrupt. Brooks, you are now going to be removed to the other courtroom. I, I have I'm had a dozen or more interruptions. Shock. I will be off the record while we do that. Thank you, everyone. I don't agree to a stop. Well, I move for a motion to dismiss for being under duress and being coerced into a contract that I, that I did not consent or agree to. I have a right to be present for trial. Screen, is that right? Okay. Yes. I'll publish that as well. All right, we are back on the record. Appearances are as they were before. I need to make a record that at 8.42 a.m., this court ordered Mr. Brooks be removed from the courtroom due to repeated uh, interruptions and disruption uh, with the court. Uh, this, of course, comes on the recent history with Mr. Brooks on every day that we have been in court since Monday. Um, he has shown a complete and utter disrespect for the simple rules of civility. Um, he has been removed from the courtroom multiple times. This morning alone, he started interrupting this court within a minute of the court calling the case. Um, I should also make a record at, at the moment he is muted uh, because of the way that he was removed from the courtroom and his conduct since. Um, I have been given just a bit of information about it. I will advise everyone that I have required that the Sheriff's Department uh, file a written report with the court uh, regarding Mr. Brooks's conduct. I'm told that um, he would not sit down while in this courtroom in order to have the shackles removed so that he could be taken to the other courtroom, that he was resisting, um, that at one point he took off a shoe and it appeared uh, to the deputies that he was going to throw the shoe. Um, you can see that he is seated with his back uh, to the court or to the camera. He took his shirt off as well. I'm also told that he is threatening to throw and break items. I want to give him headphones since he has uh, claimed in the past to be hard of hearing in one ear but given his statement that he would throw and break things um, unless he can pledge to this court uh, that he will not do that, um, I'm not going to provide that information. I will advise that the audio in that courtroom should be turned up accordingly so that uh, it is louder than it has been. I've also been advised that uh, the audio and visual equipment is working in that courtroom. The deputies that are in there can see and hear uh, the court through the polycom system. Uh, today is a little bit different in that there is no Zoom. And so, um, but this court with the uh, blessing of technology in this new building have the ability to call in one room system to the other. That is why we're able to see and when appropriately hear him when unmuted and then there are the four camera angles that are presently from this courtroom i have the camera in the other courtroom um, on a single camera since he's the only individual in there um, this court has in essence extended this courtroom to the neighboring courtroom while there is 
ample evidence in the record, not only through the proceedings up to this point, but this morning alone, uh, that through his conduct, he has forfeited his right to be present. I'd also make a finding that he uh, is appearing from that courtroom and that because of the audio and visual equipment and system that we have in place, that it is the functional equivalent of being present in this courtroom. Um, this court has relied repeatedly on Illinois versus Allen. I've read portions of that case into the record. I don't intend to go through that at length here today, other than to indicate that um, trial judges that are confronted with disruptive, contemptuous, stubbornly defiant defendants must be given sufficient discretion to meet the circumstances of each case. No one formula exists for maintaining the appropriate courtroom atmosphere will be best in all ones or in all situations. And then this point, uh, well, I'm not going to get off the bench. We're going to take a short recess for that resetting to take place. I would request an opportunity to be heard then, Your Honor, when we go back on the record, please. Absolutely. Information I received was that all of a sudden the audio was only going through two speakers and not all of them. A simple reboot of the polycom system over there took care of that, and I have confirmed that it's working properly. Um, before I turn to you, Attorney Opper, because I'm not sure if Mr. Brooks heard this or not, at the very end, before I removed him, I wanted to make sure uh, that the record is very clear. I will note a continuing objection uh, to the issues he raises regarding his name and other things. Um, he's There are filings that substantiate that. It will be my position. It's not needed for him to do that every single day because I've noted a continuing objection. With that, you wanted to make an additional record? Uh, yes, Your Honor, it's probably appropriate at this stage. Um, I, I did want to address a topic that's maybe not been raised in the courtroom. Um, but has been raised in the in the public and it seems to kind of go hand in hand with the events of this morning and that is the mental competency of Mr. Daryl Brooks to proceed to trial. The court is well aware that the district attorney has an obligation and a duty to raise any concerns as to the competency of any defendant to proceed to trial. Um, any counsel representing Mr. Brooks would have that same obligation and the court itself uh, if had if it had a concern as to the competency of any defendant to proceed, can request an evaluation that's pursuant to 971.14 of the Wisconsin statutes. At no time has anyone involved in this case had a competency concern. And I say that based on the fact that Mr. Brooks has made multiple court appearances, most of them before your honor, but at least initially he appeared uh, before two court or uh, yes, two court commissioners. Um, he's had counsel representing him up until last week on this case. And you've made a record with attorney Perry previously as to Mr. Brooks ability to understand what's going on and his ability to participate in his own defense. You made a thorough record last week when you went through his uh, waiver of right to an attorney and his absolute desire that he expressed multiple times to represent himself. I am thoroughly convinced, Your Honor, that Mr. Brooks is 100% competent to proceed to trial, that his mental capacity is not reduced in any fashion. Anybody that thinks otherwise has no involvement with this case. I would reference the court to today's filing which mr brooks provided it is extremely well written his handwriting is immaculate it's perfect the punctuation the grammar is 100 percent accurate he 
uh, drafted this himself in his jail cell last night, I presume, maybe it was this morning. Um, he has continued with the same objections that he has been making repeatedly in this case. So he clearly understands the issues. He understands the defense that he wants to pursue. He undertook the effort to have this form notarized by a, a jail a, a employee so that it is a signed and sworn affidavit. Absolutely no concerns on the part of the state of Wisconsin that Mr. Brooks has any deficiency in his competency. We are 100% convinced that these actions of Mr. Brooks are deliberate and intentional and they have escalated and the court has seen this since August 25th or so as the motions were decided by the court, most of them uh, to his detriment. His behavior became more and more difficult in the courtroom. It started out less aggressive with him sleeping and asking to be able to leave the courtroom. Then we had a toothache. Then we had um, a situation where he didn't want to come to court, was refusing to come to court. The record will be clear, Your Honor, that each time, and the Sheriff's Department has done an absolutely fantastic job dealing with Mr. Brooks fairly, professionally, respectfully at all times. We concur 100% with the record you just made as to what happened after the recess at about 842 this morning as to Mr. Brooks' conduct. These are deliberate actions on his part as we get closer and closer and closer to actually presenting this case to a jury that he is attempting to derail these proceedings and avoid the inevitable. And I wanna make that record. I tell this court as an officer of the court, we have zero concerns as to the mental competency of Daryl Brooks to proceed. And we have had many, many dealings with him on the record and off the record that I base that on. I also wanted to add one other comment as to the court's record as to the need to proceed with this trial. We concur 100%. We would also note it's not just a matter of resources. It's the need to proceed to justice. It's the need to get justice for the crime victims who have patiently attended every one of these hearings. They have a constitutional right to trial, they have a constitutional right to a speedy disposition of this case. And that doesn't mean hasty, that doesn't mean reckless, it means efficient administration of justice. And this court has provided that to the crime victims. And, and we think that's another reason that Mr. Brooks' antics, which is all they are, clearly speak for themselves. This is not his inability to understand what's going on by any stretch. Thank you, Attorney Opper, and I do appreciate you uh, raising that with the court um, because I share uh, your observations that you've just noted on the record. I would adopt them fully uh, as if they were my own and make them part of the findings that I've already made on the record. Um, obviously, I, I personally haven't listened to the jail phone calls that you uh, reference, but I do uh, take your statements as an officer of the court. I look forward to further reviewing them, if need be, changing any uh, conclusions that I've reached here today, and I would require you to file that um, exhibit uh, so that um, that can be part of the record um, as well. I would also add to what you have just stated, this court has read through not one, not two, not three, but four evaluations related to the special plea that was withdrawn. And those are very recent evaluations where the examiners um, met face-to-face -face in the jail or in an appropriate visitation room with Mr. Brooks, either in July or August of this year. And every single one of those individuals did a mental status exam that's noted in their reports. Frankly, the behavior that we're starting to see here is no different than some of the behavior that was noted by those examiners as well. 
That is, this behavior is frankly more in line with someone who's defiant, deliberate, and in line with the conclusions related to whether he suffers from a mental disease or defect that would qualify for a special plea. I've not gone into much detail and I won't. Those documents are part of the record, but it's very clear to this court that everything that he has done uh, as outlined by the state and as made evident on the record uh, of these proceedings, that it is the sole intent of Mr. Brooks to make a mockery of this process. And I've stated, and I'll state it again, I'm not gonna tolerate it, but there is, uh, I believe this trial needs to continue, should continue, not only for Mr. Brooks as the accused, who also has the right to a speedy disposition, he hasn't exercised it, the victims have a right to a speedy disposition, and uh, it's important for the justice system to go forward with this proceeding we are at the stage where we are at with Mr. Brooks muted in another courtroom because of his defiant actions. No one else. And I appreciate everyone's patience as the court goes through these things, frankly, gives Mr. Brooks time after time after time to conform his conduct to the clear expectations, but he just simply flat out refuses to do so. So what I'd like to do is finish with the um, approval of the jury instructions, the preliminary jury instructions. I will make a record that Mr. Brooks did not um, file anything in writing regarding a proposed jury instruction as he was uh, advised to do yesterday um, if he wanted me to consider something. Um, I believe we had a very clear <laughs> discussion on the record about that. He was uh, given copy, uh, a full copy of the draft preliminary jury instruction. I'll address further if need be based upon that yes or no. Uh, the microphone is unmuted. Actually, we'll need to turn him up. It's not very loud on our end. Mr. Brooks, did you say one more time? You, uh, yeah, but you know what? Your volume's a little low, so we're going to um, have them adjusted over there and in here. So give us a second. Where is the microphone? It looks like it's in front of the monitor. Mr. Brooks? Try again. Try again. Am I on the record? You are on the record. Ooh, that's loud now. We'll turn ours down. Mr. Brooks, do you, yes or no question, do you uh, have any objection to the preliminary jury instructions that were provided to you yesterday? Go ahead, answer please. All right, your objection is noted for the record, and uh, I'm just putting the mute back on. Um, he provided that objection without any legal basis. Um, I'll, I muted him just so I could ask this question. I'll be right with you, Captain. Um, Mr. Brooks, do you have a legal basis to object to those preliminary jury instructions? I'm unmuting you. Hold on, it's the volume is not being appropriate at the moment. There needs... Try it again, sir. I apologize for the technical issue. All right, the technical, we're gonna have to figure that out. It's not appropriately working. Um, I do appreciate that he was able to hear me because he leaned in to answer. So I just want to make that record. I'll take, um, I'm going to go take a recess. Um, I'll just mute while we're doing that um, just so I can uh, figure out what the audio issue is and then we'll go from there. Solely concerned the audio from the microphones in front of Mr. Brooks and the two room systems cooperating 
and we were having difficulty in this courtroom hearing Mr. Brooks. Um, I believe that issue has now been resolved. Um, when I needed to take the break for the audio issue, I also was advised by uh, the captain that Mr. Brooks was requesting medical attention and reporting a small cut to a finger as a result of uh, when he was removed from this courtroom and taken to the other courtroom. Um, I was further advised that there are no um, signs of blood and that when asked, he refused to show his hands. At this time, um, I'm not gonna pause the proceedings further for him to be seen by jail medical, but at an appropriate break, that will be done. And I also wanna make a record that Mr. Brooks has put his shirt back on. He continues to sit with his back to the camera. Mr. Brooks, I want you to be advised that I believe it's important that you face uh, the camera so that you are facing the court. You can see and hear. Um, I, it's my understanding you uh, were not willing to cooperate with being shackled and for the moment um, you are not. But at this point, given your conduct from before, um, I'm gonna require um, well, after we take the next break that the Sheriff's Department um, put you in the chair face forward and with shackles on your ankle as you are in custody and that is appropriate. I'll ask a third and final time, sir, what is the legal basis for your objection to the jury instructions? I wasn't allowed to make camera. I can't even hear what she's saying all the way, man. It's too low. You want your headset. Mr. Brooks, I can hear the deputies over there. Um, I know they can hear me. That's been confirmed. Um, there is the headset available to you should you wish to use it. If you can't hear, I would ask that you put them on. Mr. Brooks? Can you just put it down? I'm able to hear he said to the deputy, put them down. I don't want them. All right, um, I'm gonna mute once again so I continue with my record. He did not answer the question, what is the legal basis for the objection? I asked that question three times based upon that non-response. Um, his objection is noted for the record and I will approve the preliminary jury instructions um, that are on file with the court. Obviously they'll be uploaded once I read them, but. Um, all parties have been given copies of those. Before I turn to the motion for uh, reconsideration, um, you raised this earlier, at least the topic of it. Mr. Brooks um, presented a filing to the court this morning. I asked the bailiffs uh, before the case was called at 8.30 if Mr. Brooks had any paperwork and to ask him if he had any filings. He then provided this piece of paper um, and it was photocopied. Actually, it was uh, date stamped, then photocopied for the parties. It may have already been scanned in, I'm not sure, but it certainly will be. Um, I've had an opportunity to review this document um, Based upon my review, I don't believe any response is even required. Um, it's his affidavit. He's providing certain disclosures, but there's nothing about that uh, that requests any relief from the court. Certainly no legal um, statutes or constitutional provisions are referenced. Uh, to me, it just looks like an objection that he's filing, and that will be, of course, noted for the record. Um, Attorney Opper, uh, anything you would want to add to the record on this, any position you are taking? No, I also viewed this as, because he labeled it objection by affidavit, I think my interpretation is he was trying to make a record for appeal that he objects to the court's previous ruling. I don't think there's anything the court needs to do with this document at this time. All right, thank you. 
then we'll move on to the motion for reconsideration. And again, I'm keeping Mr. Brooks muted so that I can get through this process orderly, efficiently, when necessary. I will unmute him if the court has questions. All right, Attorney Opera, I have read through the um, motion. Is there anything you want to add to what you have put in your filing? Only one other observation, Your Honor, that um, since I filed that the events of the last couple of days, I think further support my request, not that um, the defendant's behavior in the courtroom has anything to do with the broadcasting of victims and witnesses, but I think the stress that is going to be placed upon them potentially by Mr. Brooks' behavior will be additional challenge to them as they testify and um, so not having their faces displayed, I think would help ease some of that tension for those individuals. Mr. Brooks, my first question to you is, um, do you have a position on the state's request in their motion for reconsideration? I'm looking for a yes or no answer. If you, I'll unmute and provide that to me. Go ahead. I didn't hear what they said. I just put the headphones on, so I didn't even hear what, they, what she said. Um, sir, it's a written document that was filed and you were provided uh, a copy of that yesterday. We took a recess yesterday so it could be served upon you. If you haven't read it, that's your choice. What I'm asking you is do you have any position on their request to, for this court to reconsider um, the denial of the court's sort of the denial of the state's request to prohibit the photography and video recording of victims and witnesses and specifically their faces while they testify. A rule that was already, uh, we already talked about that. You already ruled that uh, the victims and witnesses will, will be shown. That was already ruled on. You are correct, but they filed a motion for reconsideration. That's a, that's the document uh, that was provided to you yesterday. Uh, I'm asking if you have any uh, position on the request that I reconsider my ruling. Yeah, it was, it was everything supposed to be public. This is a public trial. I, I don't, I don't understand why there would be even the need to reconsider what you already ruled on at this point, as far as to, to that, to that particular issue. I take it's your a public trial. It's a public trial. Um, anybody can, essentially watch the trial um and like i said as far as with with the uh, technology that we're in now if they have to be sworn in by name that in itself makes them easy to if somebody wanted to pull them up or find them or find out who was testifying at any given time testimony is given it'd be pretty easy for them to be found and to be seen so i mean that's just the age we're in anyway as far as as far as with social media and google and and, and all these different things we got all this technology basically at our fingertips so i i don't i don't understand uh how it needs to be changed at this point when it was it was already ruled that this is a public trial there's going to be a lot of things that are going to be shown why not keep everything public the way that is intended to be and because of the fact that you've already ruled on it made that on a record let's keep it the way it is all right thank you mr brooks i appreciate your legal analysis of that and your factual analysis of the prior ruling that this court gave. I thought you did an excellent job making some very good points, many of which I uh, relied upon previously. I am certainly mindful of the potential stress that it may cause for victims and other witnesses, but this is a case that the state brought charges and rightly so. I understand it won't be easy, it may be messy, uh, it may even be stressful, but it's important to the integrity of these proceedings, the perception of how things are conducted in this courtroom, that all witnesses, that all victims, with the exception of the one 
everything I accepted previously be viewed in its fullness to the public. I maintain the exception for juvenile witnesses. Um, they are in a special category as minors, and they, of course, uh, when they, if and when a juvenile witness testifies, may only be captured from uh, the shoulders down. Their faces are not to be broadcast. Again, I am not unmindful of the impact, but in my humble opinion, the right to a public trial um, supersedes the other provisions, and especially in a case such as this, it's important. Um, I would add to the record um, some of the points Mr. Brooks made. Not only are these names all a matter of public record, um, the technology that we have at our fingertips, there's Google, there's social media. It's very easy to identify these individuals and search for them in other ways. I'd also add that there have been a number of news reports, media accounts, newspaper articles about victims, naming them. Um, I'm aware of one such broadcast this morning on Channel 4. I cannot presume that all victims all witnesses want this. And I wanna keep this trial going and um, that's what we will do. So the request is denied. All right, I believe, let me just get back to my first note that I had for this morning that we've covered all of the outstanding issues. Um, but I did not hear if you, uh, I was kind of overhearing that you addressed the filing that I filed this morning. I, I didn't did. hear exactly what was said. I'm just making sure that you know that I'm not trying to interrupt. I just want clarification on what I may have missed. Um, I'll tell you what I uh, ruled previously. I've reviewed the filing. It's entitled Objection by Affidavit to the State's Response and the Court's Opinion and Order and Defendant's Disclosure Statement by Affidavit. It's an affidavit. It does not request any relief from the court. Um, I have interpreted what you have filed um, as an objection to be noted on the record. It has been accepted. It has been filed and that your objection is noted. The court need not take any specific action as it relates to it. Um, I further indicated that, again, no relief was requested, but also there's no statutory or constitutional or law uh, that you cite to that I could even um, interpret as a request for relief. So that's how I'm going to address that uh, filing, sir. It's noted for the record. Can I say one thing about that? Quickly, sir. I need to keep going. I was, I was um, filing that paperwork, um, I would say, pursuant to uh, federal the federal rules of criminal procedure under Rule 12.4 about the disclosure statement. All right, I'll um, note so that will... for the record, sir, but it was not in your filing. So that's a judicial determination, Your Honor? I believe I had one other thing. Oh, I did want to put on the record, um, and that is when we were testing the audio, I did advise the Sheriff's Department to uh, let Mr. Brooks know, to ask him on my behalf if he wanted to come back into this courtroom. Um, my understanding is he declined. No, that is not. That is not accurate, Your Honor. Mr. Brooks. I, the reason. Mr. Brooks. I, I would just want to. Hold on. I'm going to mute record. you for a second unless you stop and listen to me. I just heard what you said, but I just. I'm not asking for a response, sir. Not, Mr. Brooks. It's not. It's okay. Not accurate, You're interrupting. Your Hold on. You're interrupting me, sir. I wasn't looking for a response. Um, I'm happy to ask you the question myself on the record for you to answer it. Um, I will give you the opportunity to come back into this courtroom. You have demonstrated that you can make cogent, coherent, articulate uh, arguments on the record. You just did that. Um, you've been respectful for the time being. Um, I will ask you, sir, do you want to come back into this courtroom? You've been unmuted to answer that 
question. Not until I can receive medical treatment for the bruise that I have on my arm and the cut. You said, you just said a while ago on the record that you cannot see blood. That's because I wiped it on my pants and you can still see the blood in the cut and a big bruise right here on my arm. I was told that the nurse would be coming in to see me. And then I was told, no, she's going to come at the next recess, which we just took. A, I know it was technical difficulties why you call it the recess, but that was more than enough time for me to at least be seen, at least get the, the uh, cut cleaned out and get it bandaged, at least at minimum that, and for somebody to look at this bruise. That was, that was my position on why I was not yet ready to come back into the court because I feel like this needs to be addressed. All right, Mr. Brooks, I understand your request. I'm denying the request to take an adjournment, or I'm sorry, to take a break at this time. Um, no, I'm not asking for a break. I didn't ask for a break. I was just saying that at the time that there was the technical difficulty recess, <laughs> before, before you even caught that, Your Honor, I was told that a nurse was coming in at that time, but then when you called the recess for the technical difficulty, I was then told that I would have to wait until another recess to be able to be seen by the nurse, which my my thing was, Mr. I wanted Brooks, to you've made your by record, the nurse. okay? I don't need you to go further with that. You've made your record. I'm going to mute you for the time being. I want you to be aware, sir, I was advised regarding the cut, the bruises, new information. I... Uh, made a determination that you would be seen at the next appropriate break. Um, from my perspective, a small cut and a bruise is not going to hold up the start of uh, bringing the jurors in and advising them of the preliminary jury instructions. If that means the next break we take is for lunch and that's when you are seen, um, then that's what will happen. So um, I don't think I've overlooked anything, Attorney Opper, but anything you had on your list. Nothing else on my list, but you want to give Mr. Brooks one more opportunity to change out of his orange jail uniform, excuse me. <clears throat> that I would give him an opportunity uh, to do. Uh, Mr. Brooks, would you like to go back and change into your suit? My position has not changed whatsoever, and it will not change as it is my right to come into court how I would like to, just like I should be awarded the right to be present for every proceedings in this trial. All right, um, I'm muting him again. I uh, note your objection. I will take that as a clear indication. You do not want to go uh, back to the jail to change into uh, street or civilian clothing that you are exercising your right to dress in the jail attire. Um, all right, then with that, um, I am going to uh, just take a short recess just to have the jurors brought in. I think Mr. Brooks needs his objection sign. We'll make sure he has it. Thank you. Let me actually go back on the record for a second. Mr. Brooks, when the jury comes in, I am going to read through the preliminary jury instructions. Um, since those have been approved by the court, um, if you happen to raise your sign, I'll note it for the record, but I'm not going to ask you for any type of argument on that because we've already had that opportunity to do so. Um, it will take me some time to read through the instructions. I, I don't know if that will take us to the lunch hour or not. The state should be potentially prepared to go through its opening. Um, Mr. Brooks, if we do get to that point where the state is giving its opening um, and you have an objection, you need to write down the objection in addition to raising your uh, hand and I will rule on the objections after the closing statement. So you must write down uh, the basis for the objection and what you're objecting to. In addition to holding up your sign, that's the procedure that we will follow. All right, now we're on a short break until the jury comes in.
off the computer. Do not permit anyone to communicate with you about this matter, either in person, electronically, or by other means. If anyone does so despite you telling them not to, you should report that to me. I appreciate that it's tempting when you go home in the evening to discuss this case with another member of your household, but you may not do so. This case must be decided by you, the jurors, based on the evidence presented in the courtroom. People not serving on this jury have not heard the evidence and it is improper for them to influence your deliberations and decision in this case. After the trial is completed, you are free to communicate with anyone in any manner. These rules are intended to assure that jurors remain impartial throughout the trial. If any juror has reason to believe that another juror has violated these rules, you should report it to me. If jurors do not comply with these rules, it could result in a new trial involving additional time and significant expense to the parties and the taxpayers. You are to decide the case solely on the evidence offered and received at trial. You are not required to, but you may take notes during the trial, except during the opening statements and closing arguments. The court will provide you with the materials. In making notes, you must be careful that it does not distract you from carefully listening to and observing the witnesses. You may rely on your notes to refresh your memory during your deliberations. Otherwise, keep them confidential. After the trial, the notes will be collected and destroyed. You will not have a copy of the written transcript of the trial testimony available for use during your deliberations. You should pay careful attention to all the testimony because you must rely primarily on your memory of the evidence and testimony introduced at trial. During the course of a trial, the parties may refer to or use police reports with witnesses. Normally, these police reports will not be provided to you. If you are not provided with a police report, you should use your collective memory regarding any reference to police reports. The defendant has a constitutional right to represent himself. I have advised the defendant that the same rules apply whether a lawyer acts for him or he acts for himself. The defendant has decided to represent himself and this decision must not influence your verdict in any manner. This court is tasked with ensuring the orderly administration of the case. My job includes making sure that the defendant's rights are protected, making sure that the state and the defendant can present their respective cases in a coherent and orderly fashion.